So uh, our speaker today is Nate Johnson, who uh, all of you know, of course, already. Uh, let's see if I can find any fun facts about him in his biography. Uh, he was baptized at the age of four in the Episcopal Church of the Heavenly Rest in Abilene, Texas. But he grew up attending church here in Trinity. Uh, he sang in the choir. Uh, he studied music at IU and at William Patterson College in New Jersey. He also studied uh, computer information science at Ivy Tech, although he couldn't figure out how to turn the microphone off. He, <laughs> <laughs> he uh, currently works as a security consultant for ThoughtWorks, a global software consultancy. He's a member and former chairperson of Trinity's Commission on Compassion, Peace, and Reconciliation, and is passionate about racial justice and the role that the church has to play in bringing about God's beloved community. He's here to talk to us today about a project that he's been working on for many months now with the Bloomington Multi-Faith Alliance, looking at the uh, problem of racially uh, segregated uh, housing or covenants or housing deeds. Um, as I'm sure many of you know, the net worth of the average uh, African American family is a fraction of the net worth of the average white family in the United States. And a lot of that is tied to uh, systemic racism over many, many generations that have kept uh, African Americans from attaining real estate and maintaining real estate that has led, has, that basically is the building block of so, uh, net worth in many cases. So uh, the project that Dave has been working on is looking at the problem from the building today. Exactly how the problem began, how deep seated the problem is, and eventually we will talk about what to do about that, but that's not necessarily what we'll do today. So, Nate, I'm going to turn it over to you. Oh, thank you, Tony. And yeah, hello to everyone, and thank you for uh, spending this time here with me today. Can you hear me okay? Oh, okay, great. Um, so you're going to notice, I'm sure you're going to notice, that my slides are going to have like a ton of information on them. You do not have to read every slide. <laughs> I'm going to explain everything, so if you just want to listen to me, uh, that's fine. The, the slides are, this is a document meant to be a reference, and I can share them if you want to go through everything yourself. And also, I want to draw your attention to uh, the paper and pens on your table. Um, I'd like to ask you to please, um, during the course of my talk, if you have questions, um, please write them down and save them until the end. I'm not going to talk this whole time. I'm going to leave a lot of time um, for discussion. So, if you have burning questions, yeah, please go ahead and write them down. And also, uh, Please um, examine your feelings, and if you have reactions to uh, the information I'm going to share with you, please go ahead and write it down. Let's talk about that. So, um, this is the map. This is what I'm here to talk about. Um, and that is a research project that, yeah, as Tony said, I've been working on for a number of months, maybe six months, I'm not sure I wasn't counting. Um, but this racially restricted Bloomington mapping project, it visualizes properties and neighborhoods in Bloomington that were once whites only. Um, these uh, restrictions are, they've been an important part of the history of Bloomington, um, but not really widely known. A lot of people actually don't know about this stuff. Um, uh, our hope is that this map can be used as a tool in pursuit of racial justice and housing justice in Bloomington. But the map is just a tool. It's not an end, it's a, it's a means to an end. This map is, is not justice. This map is just a tool to visualize injustice. Um, it contains individual properties as well as subdivisions, also known as housing additions. With, with racially restrictive covenants that once prevented the properties from being sold or rented to people of color. Properties um, are on this map, they're, they're based on their current street addresses. 
Those don't always correspond one to one with the property deeds. You know, some properties are split, some properties are merged over time. Um, and then also in yellow on the map are the Council of Neighborhood Associations, Kona neighborhoods that have significant overlap with the rest of the properties. There are 387 properties on the map, 10 subdivisions, and 10 Kona neighborhoods. Um, the map, its source data, and supporting material are all uh, published now on the public internet. They're linked from the website of the Bloomington Multi-Faith Alliance, and um, I'll share it directly at the end of the presentation. So first we need to talk about the, the racially restrictive covenants. Um, our story starts in 1917. Before that, it was common for, for cities and towns to pass laws to enforce uh, housing segregation. You know, certain neighborhoods, blacks couldn't live there. But in, the, in 1917, the Supreme Court ruled in Buchanan versus Worley that racial housing discrimination by city ordinance was unconstitutional. After that ruling, people turned to contract law um, and started using racially restrictive covenants as agreements between parties. Um, they attached them to property deeds and housing subdivisions. And then in 1948, the Supreme Court decided in Shelley versus Kramer that those covenants were unconstitutional and hence unenforceable. But racial housing discrimination continued um, through social practice even well past the time of the 1968 Fair Housing Act when the federal government um, ruled in final that housing discrimination based on race or other factors was unconstitutional. The thing is, these racially restrictive covenants, they shut black people and other racialized groups out of property ownership and rental options that were available to white people. Where these covenants were in effect, white people had the advantage of proximity to good employers, businesses, and services that were just not available to people of color. Furthermore, white property owners were able to build generational wealth through property investment and home ownership in these racially restricted areas for decades while people of color were not able to do that. In the United States, the single number one most important vehicle for building generational wealth is home ownership. And these racially restrictive covenants, you know, shut a lot of black families out uh, from that opportunity. This is an example of a racially restrictive covenant from Bloomington. It's from 1927. Um, it's a deed for an individual property. It's lot 41 in the Hunter Park edition in Bloomington. This is uh, just south of campus. And uh, here's what it says. This deed is made upon the express consideration and agreement between the parties that the premises shall never be deeded, leased, or mortgaged to a person of the Negro race. And any such deed, lease, or mortgage shall of itself forfeit all the right, title, and interest in said premises to the grantor in such instrument, and title to said premises shall forthwith and thereupon revert to and vest in the grantor herein. Um, it's written in lawyer speak, but it says that if you buy the property and you sell it to a black family or lease it to black people, then it's not your property anymore. It goes back to the person that sold it to you. So I wanted to include that because of how how shocking it is in like, sort of our contemporary culture. Obviously, um, there's still a lot of racism in, um, in our contemporary culture, but we, we almost never see it so blatantly spelled out, and, and we don't see it in contract law anymore either, because it's illegal. Um, this is a housing subdivision plat map for Maxwell Manors. Um, this is now part of the Elm Heights neighborhood south of campus. And here's what's attached to Maxwell Manors. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of words here. Uh, I, I'm going to select out the important bits for this conversation. 
Um, the ownership of lots or buildings in the subdivision are forever restricted to members of the pure white race and his domestic servants not of the pure white race. Um, forever. They meant this to be forever. If any arrangement is made allowing occupancy to any person not of the pure white race except for domestic service, then the property is forfeit to the undersigned owners, Roy Pike and Reginald Stahl. So, you know, if you violated the terms, these two guys got to own your property. I don't know who these guys are. Um, if any person not of the pure white race occupies a property in the subdivision, any other property owner in the subdivision can sue in court to have them removed without having to show any kind of damage. That's a direct quote. No damage. So that's what the, uh, that's what the racial covenants are that they look like. Want to talk a little bit about how we got all this stuff. Um, like the data that we used to generate this map was collected uh, actually by three different teams. Volunteers at the Monroe County History Center, led by research librarian manager Megan McDonald, they went through all the old Monroe County deed books and just, you know, took note of every deed that had a, had a restriction on it, put it in a spreadsheet. Um, the History Center uh, houses all of the deed books um, from the beginning of Bloomington up through 1950, and then the Monroe County Recorder's Office housed all the deed books from 1950 onward. Um, so that was one group, the folks at the History Center, and the second group was, um, was you know, our little research group that we put together. We were volunteers associated with the Faith for Racial Equity sub, uh, Subcommittee of the Bloomington Multi-Faith Alliance. Um, and we reviewed all the deeds in the spreadsheet, we used property descriptions to track down the current street addresses, and we added those to the map. And then we also did, you know, a bit of historical research as well. Okay, I'm going to keep having to do this, aren't I? Let's way back up here. And um, so that research team was myself, Ruth Ives, Alan Edmonds, Keith Gerber, Yusuf Ahmed, uh, Elizabeth Johnson, Millie Moran, John Summerlot, and Sarah Lynn Gershon. So it was a group of people from different faith communities in Bloomington. Um, and then the subdivisions with racially restrictive covenants, so the neighborhoods on the map, those were identified and collected by Monroe County recorder Eric Schmitz and his staff. So um, as of uh, December of last year, we, we had gone through all of the properties in the deed books from 1917 through 1935. Um, we, we've shared our spreadsheet, and if you want to look at it, um, it looks like this. It can be used to kind of work backwards, you know, through the property. Um, we've made every effort to be as accurate as possible, but uh, but I'm sure there are mistakes. Um, we, through, through the course of our research, we found deeds like sort of outside of our process that we couldn't find on the spreadsheets or in the deed books, and there may have been things in the deed books that we overlooked. Um, all of this data was collected by humans and it's absolutely subject to human error. <laughs> so, um, let's talk a bit about what has happened in Bloomington. Um, we found that there were properties in all quadrants of Bloomington, north, south, east, and west, with restrictive covenants, but the heaviest concentration um, of properties were in very close proximity to the IU Bloomington campus, either on campus, or within a few blocks of campus. And the current entity with the largest holding of properties in this collection is Indiana University. The second largest concentration of properties is in the northwest corner of Bloomington in um, a subdivision that was called uh, Maple Grove Baby Farms. Let's see, do I have a, uh, let me find, where's the map? There, it'd be helpful to look at this. So yeah, up there in the top left of Bloomington, um, not approaching Ellisville, but this other little cluster sort of halfway, yeah, that, that's the Maple Grove Baby Farms subdivision. 71 of 101 lots in that neighborhood have racially restrictive covenants attached to them. So in, in other neighborhoods, they would put the, the 
covenant on the plat itself. In this neighborhood, I don't know why, but they put them on all the individual properties, or at least most of them. Uh, there's two kind of smaller concentrations of properties north of Bloomington. Um, Ten properties in the King and Stanker Baby Farm subdivision, and 11 in the Northcliff subdivision. Um, let's see. Uh, and then looking at the names of the grantors and grantees of these transactions, it became very obvious that um, there were a lot of very prominent leaders at the university. Um, I.E. Bloomington contained many like sort of important historical figures um, that I had heard of, I'm sure you would have heard of, that were involved with this. Um, I'm going to name a couple of them. Um, Agnes Wells, who was a parishioner at, at Trinity, and we'll talk a little bit more about Agnes here in a sec, but also uh, Paul McNutt, law professor, dean of the law school, chairman of Indiana State Democratic Party, governor of Indiana, ambassador to the Philippines, namesake of McNutt Quadrangle, um, Carl Eigenman, Professor of Zoology, first dean of the graduate school, namesake of Eichmann Hall. William Lowe Bryan, professor of English, Greek, and philosophy, founder of the American Psychological Association, president of IU, namesake of Bryan Hall. Ernest Lindley, professor of philosophy, psychology, president of the University of Idaho, chancellor of the University of Kansas, namesake of Lindley Hall. Uh, Nellie Teeter, First woman IU trustee, namesake of Teeter Quad, Alfred Kinsey, pioneer of sexology, founder and namesake of the Kinsey Institute, um, William S. Curry uh, from Curry Auto Center, uh, Albert Hoadley, Hoadley Stone Quarry, Charles Woolery, Woolery Stone Company. So these properties, there's a lot of upscale homes, there's some rental houses some modest houses, but large tracts of IU Bloomington, um, including uh, buildings currently occupied by the Mathematics Department, the E-House Office of Sustainability, Center for the Integrative Study of Animal Behavior, Human, Resource, uh, Human Resources College of Arts and Sciences, Admissions Administration, Wilkie Quad, I mean, it goes on and on and on, uh, also including Canterbury House. Um, local businesses, including Wigwam Boutique, Choice Realty and Management, City Flats on Walnut, the list goes on and on and on. So, so many local businesses, uh, many, many uh, properties on campus. Um, the list of names I mentioned were just ones that I recognized. There, there's a lot of names on here. Um, yeah, go ahead. I apologize, but I'm very confused. I need some dates, I think, um, to talk about IU, were these properties gifted to IU, do these covenants still exist, if the law has changed, I, I feel like we're pointing a finger and I don't know at what level we're trying to say, I think I'm going too far here, but I apologize, but I need some boundaries that I feel like I don't know how to address this issue. Is it current? Did all these covenants change after 1968? And I'm going to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for speaking up. I really appreciate that. Um, this is exactly what I want to talk with you all about. I have all the same questions that you do. I do. So let me just get through a couple more things, and then and then let's and then let's talk about this stuff. Um, let's see. I'm, I'm going to skip a couple of things. Where are we? Okay, red lighting. Um, I'll just, just quickly say, uh, like by strict definition, redlining didn't happen in Bloomington. Bloomington wasn't big enough for HOLC to create a redlining map for Bloomington. Um, 
There's a difference between de jure and de facto segregation. De jure segregation was enforceable by the courts. De facto segregation was enforceable by social practice, and there is a lot of that in Bloomington. It, it continues at least through the 1970s and 1980s. We know this from the narrative history of our black neighbors. Um, so, in, uh, in 2021, the Indiana State House uh, passed House Bill 1314, and this allows property owners to attach a notice or a, like sort of an addendum to their property deed. The thing is, these racially restrictive covenants cannot be removed from the property deeds. They're not enforceable, they're illegal, but they cannot be removed from these historic documents. But if you have one that is attached to a property that you own, it is within your right to attach an addendum that basically says, this is not enforceable. Um, so that's really the only thing that kind of can be legally done. Um, some, some say that this is just like sort of a, a symbolic act, um, and that might be true, uh, but court decisions are overturned. We've seen this Supreme Court overturn court decisions, so I think there are a lot of, there is a lot of worry about these deeds. I mean, what if the Supreme Court said, yeah, that, that is enforceable. I mean, it's within their authority to do so. And then let's just briefly talk about a few uh, Trinity parishioners, and then let's do some reflection. So uh, what I've done is to cross-reference the names on our painted windows and the um, dedication plaques that are on our pews. I've cross-referenced those names against the spreadsheet, and there, and there are some Trinity par parishioners who are buying and selling properties with racially restrictive covenants, including Agnes Wells. And um, I'd like to say a couple things about Agnes Wells, and I think that this might help you understand kind of where we're coming from uh, as, as historic researchers here. We are not pointing the finger and, and we're not laying blame at the feet of Agnes Wells. This happened a hundred years ago. We cannot interview these people. We do not know what was in their hearts and minds. I'm trying to keep my laptop from going to sleep. Um, Agnes is really important to us at, and the history at Trinity. She is a beloved parishioner. Um, we're proud of her for a very good reason. Uh, she was an historically important feminist, professor of math and astronomy. I used Dean of Women and namesake of Bell's Quad. Um, she was featured in Reverend Matt's sermon on uh, June 12th, uh, Trinity Sunday, our feast of title and celebration of our 150th anniversary. Um, in, in his sermon, Reverend Matt observed that Agnes Wells and her partner, Lydia Woodridge, are memorialized on this painted window. So Agnes uh, purchased one lot with a restricted covenant on it. Um, it's on North Woodlawn. It was later merged with several other lots and is currently the location of Kappa Alpha, Kappa Alpha Theta. But then a few years later, she sold 24 lots to Elizabeth Carr. 24 lots with restrictive covenants on it. Um, we also have William F. Book, um, yeah, he bought, he bought a couple of properties from the University Courts Realty Company. Don't know much about William Book. Um, he, he was a professor. Um, Beryl Holland, Maud Graham. Lots of Maud Graham. Um, Mrs. Henry Lester Smith. Paul Feltus. Carl and Florence Franzen. I, I, don't, I don't know much about these folks, except that we memorialize them in our church. So, um, try to get through that as quickly as I could. I'd like to invite you to consider this part of our history and its effect on our community as we work to pursue racial justice in Bloomington. Um, my next two slides I'm going to share, have some prompting questions on them that I'd like you to consider, questions related to this map. And I'd like you to search your feelings and um, maybe think about writing down your responses. 
Um, so, so let's look at the first slide. Let's take a, let's just take a, a few minutes of quiet and we'll just consider some of these questions. I invite you to write down your responses. There's paper and pens on the table. And um, yeah, let's just think about this for a second. There's a lot going on here. You'll have to read, the book, read it. We can't Okay, let me read some of these questions. Um, share in one or two words your emotional reaction to this map. Were you aware of these racially restrictive covenants? Would you have been allowed to live anywhere in Bloomington when these covenants were in effect? How might these restrictions have affected your opportunities for employment, for building wealth, for friendship and community? What are some possible reasons that the people involved in these transactions might have had for agreeing to the racially restrictive covenants? If your current property had a racially restrictive covenant on it, how would you feel about that? And uh, last question, how might the effects of these restrictive covenants from a hundred years ago still be with us today? Mike, yeah, or I, I can repeat quest, um, questions, but it'd be better if people can just represent themselves. <laughs> So we'll try to get a wireless microphone working if you would like to share your thoughts or feelings or if you have a question. Um, but until then, um, yeah, I wonder if, if, if anyone would like to share something. If you feel comfortable, please stand and speak with a loud voice. Yes, please, in the back. Did that stop racial 
Sure. It's so important. Oh, you're welcome. Um, before we go on, I'd like to share a couple of things. Um, Ruth, thank you. And I agree. Like, clearly Bloomington has been struggling, and, and all places, but Bloomington has been struggling this for, with, with this issue for generations. And um, our group recently came across a, a, a full-page ad in the paper in 1961 um, signed by 500 homeowners that were associated with the Monroe County Council of Churches declaring that um, they felt strongly that their neighborhoods were open to anyone of any creed, any race, any type, and that they were very opposed to racially restricted housing. Um, we, we're, we're trying to find out more about that, but I, but I think it points out exactly what you were talking about, Ruth, um, that there have always been uh, people in Bloomington that were also struggling for justice, for God's justice. Yes, Betty Rose. This will maybe sound like yes, but, but it builds on, builds on Ruth's question. I believe that in, in your neighborhood, the near west side, uh, the showers, I don't know if they were brothers, but the people who operated the furniture factory, um, somehow or another created possibilities for their black employees to live. Is that my misinformed? Um, well, you know, I've heard some of this history, and I've heard enough of this history to know that it is kind of contested history. Um, but there, but there were a lot of uh, black families that lived in the near West Side neighborhood for sure. Yes. Yes. I'm sorry, I don't know everyone's name. Okay, fine. By the way, you're not wearing name tags. <laughs> um, in 1967. Uh, IU um, had Homer Neo arrive as a physicist at uh, Indiana University. Homer was black. Homer was incredibly smart. He was always um, coming up with wonderful ideas. And that was his life, being a physicist. Uh, his wife, uh, Jean, uh, had to run everything else. <laughs> so she had come with him from Michigan. Her father uh, was black, and he was a chemist at one of the uh, big companies up there. She was well educated, and she had, was used to comfort. So she got here. Homer was were still um, being a physicist, and she needed to get a house for her family. So she signed up, and this person uh, took her around, and they were always very modest, kind of run-down neighborhoods. So finally, she said to him, you know, you know, I, I, don't, I don't want this. I want, I want to find something really nice. Well, that was not something he was willing to do. So that was the end of that. But Jean had affluence from her father. <laughs> and so she went around and she found this lovely neighborhood and there was this lovely lot and she put, put up a beautiful, big, lovely house. Uh, so there were people from coming from other parts where they had been accepted. And she was one of them. I always love that story. Thank you. Can you summarize, please? Yes. What? Can you summarize what was said? In 1967, um, a, a professor moved to Bloomington, a physics professor, and his name was Homer, Homer, Neal. Homer, Neal. Homer Neal, and he was black, and he and his wife were, were able to build a big, beautiful home in Bloomington. Um, and, uh, and that's because his wife was pushy. Because <laughs> his wife was pushy about it. Yeah, and they weren't they weren't being shown houses that she yeah. wanted to live in. Yeah, yeah. that's okay. the point. And they weren't being shown houses that that she wanted to buy, so they ended up yeah. having to build for themselves. Let's let's do one more question on this slide, or one one more person sharing. Yeah, please. I just wanted to add on there. She was able to do it because she had resources. Well, yes. Because she had resources. She already she had resources. Okay. Um, uh, one more, Verlin, and then let's and then let's look at a, a couple more questions, please, Verlin. Would uh, you mind standing? This is just a sharing. Uh, when I was a graduate student, uh, one of my professors, Betty Pat, uh, told the story. At that time, the people in the IST. Uh, or uh, department were also part of the AV Center, and they did films. And th this is kind of a counter on uh, 
what we said about current wells. Uh, but, so they shot the picture of a chorus uh, as part of a PR thing. And there was a black person in the middle of the front row. And he was called in and told that he couldn't do it. He had to reshoot that uh, to leave the black person out of there, or at least put him in a back row. I don't remember which it was, but the pressures were still there yeah. uh, and reflected by the administration on the way they were trying to present it by you. Okay, I, I'd like to prompt you with with a few more questions. Those were practical. These might be a little more uh, focused in on our faith tradition. So I'm going to read these questions. Um, how does it make you feel knowing that some Trinity parishioners bought and sold properties with racially restrictive covenants? Do you think that Trinity Church should be accountable for these injustices of the past? What could we do as church, the body of Christ in this world, to repair these harms of the past? Is there anything from our Episcopal faith, scripture, tradition, reason, that suggests that we should do anything in response to this information? If so, what would the guiding principles be? And if we do take action in response to housing discrimination in Bloomington, how can we be sure that we are acting faithfully in accordance with our baptismal covenant? Will you strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being? Well, first I have a question that goes with uh, the how does it make you feel about, about the parishioners. Were these people aware that these covenants were on the properties they bought? Or were some of them just innocent? You buy a piece of property and you don't know that the like with Agnes. Did she know all these properties had these covenants? You know, that's a really good question. And well, that I wish we difference. could ask them, right? Yeah. I think it does make a big difference. Yeah. I've told, uh, many times in the overall world, you don't see the covenants. And I did get to see one, I think it was for the Bridgeport Majors, and it had some uh, restrictions. I think it was just mixed race. Um, but still, we knew that it wasn't being enforced. And then, so, you know, didn't know what to do about it. Yeah. It's on my property. Is it? Yeah. I could go to the bank and get it. But I, you know, my notion is that it is unenforceable. But I would really like to have a copy of this um, disclaimer. Yeah. To add. And I think if we all looked at our property and did that, we would be making some kind of statement. I think so too. Yes, please. Uh, my name is Vern. So this is the first time uh, you're at Trinity. So welcome. <laughs> I think it's really important as a fixed faith group to be able to strive for permanent change. I mean, there are a lot of young people who are in fact, I'm, I'm only a sophomore at IU and I already feel this, where there's so much stimuli coming to a whole new place that it's really difficult for people in their early 20s to advocate for major change in a community such as Bloomington, which is so accepting and it's so about um, this love and, and like supporting interfaith community discussion and this entire and I've met more people from different backgrounds than any other place in the entire city of Indiana here. And so it's important to strive for that change and to protect people who are at risk. Um, but by moving forward and possibly adding addendums, it may be for best interest to make more permanent change to reflect how loving of the space and loving of the community looks and really is. And so, more than anything, no matter, and like, more than anything, even if people weren't aware of those addendums in the past and those racial restrictions, we have the opportunity now to fix that, and we're now aware of it, and make justice for the future of Bloomington, and for people to keep enjoying how lovely the community is. And I'm very happy to be here today. So, thank you very much. Serving a senior board member in Episcopal Church in East Lansing, Michigan, which is 
Michigan State University. Our church is a, you know, three or four blocks from the university, and we have been dealing exactly with this. And, and we are, we, we have moved ahead on something which may not be your path, but last Sunday at our annual meeting, I actually did a presentation on reparations uh, because we had uh, covenants until 1969. Uh, one of our earliest parishioners was a black professor who could not buy a house, and we happened to know that we didn't do everything we could to help that man. It turned out the university president bought him a house so he could live in East Lansing, Michigan. And there are all kinds of stories, just like your stories about who did and who didn't. But what we decided is that our church has really benefited from being in this place where people shared their generational wealth, where the property that we have sold is worth so much more than the property on the other side of the uh, highway, where which always goes through black yes. communities, yes. right? Yes. Um, yeah, exactly. 496, and, uh, and everyone who was dislocated were renters, and so there was no compensation. Anyway, you all will have your own conversation and you'll get to a different place, but we're really looking at putting, not just effort, but we're putting money into, um, not individuals, but to, to dealing with the, um, the inequities in our, in our own community. And we're, we have decided where everything is going. It's sort of a three-year um, plan here, but um, our congregation is, is behind us because we've all, and we're really talking about repairing the breach. And um, so I, I, I don't want to say all that to tell you where you all will wind up on this, but we've spent two years in this conversation. And that's really, that's where the Lord has led us. It dismays me to know about the past, but you know, it's a reality. So I think it's really great that we're kind of acknowledging that to some degree. And given that information, so how can we move forward in a way that, um, and I, and I want to say, without a lot of judgment on our former parishioners, because yeah. they're, uh, they're part of their own time and upbringing and what have you. Um, and so acknowledge the past and look with hope to a better future. And, and that may mean that we need to put some money into it. But I think discussion, I'm a firm believer, if we can just at least get helpful conversations going for Pete's sakes throughout the community on a broader, um, you know, across a broader community, that would be a wonderful first start. I uh, have had several reactions to this. They all sort of hover around the ideas of horror and grief. When we were hearing the, the texts of the, the actual covenants being read, it just shocked me. Um, having said that, I also feel this sense of hope that you just described, that perhaps we can step in and do something to help. Um, we can't erase the past, but we can perhaps help to shape the future so that people who are affected deeply by the past can face the future with more hope. Um, and so I have two questions. One of them is just a technical thing. Are we able to determine when those covenant clauses were added, or was it only at the very inception of each deed? So what we have are transactions in the deed book, and when there is a racially restrictive covenant attached to the property deed, it shows up in that transaction. Um, not all of the deed... So some of the deed books are digitized, but not these... These are too old for that. Um, so we, we know when they're attached to a transaction, um, if we don't see a transaction prior to that, we can assume that it was inserted at that time, um, but we are making some assumptions when we do that. Oh, thank did you stay on another question? I do. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you, that's helpful. Um, do, does Trinity have a group, um, and then we have a, a, a racial justice group, but do we have a group that gives people a forum in which we can process our own responses to these things. Some of us recognize um, my own family history uh, included slave owners. And I find that horrifying to say out loud. And I'm 
struggling to try to figure out what my responsibility in this world is, who have benefited from all of that history. And my ease and uh, stability in this world is in part based on the ownership of slaves. And so I feel an obligation to look at this, and I'm wondering if we have a venue that gives people, and I don't think I'm alone in this, uh, a place to talk about those things, and to strategize and perhaps come up with some concrete ideas. Like Not yet, but I love that idea. Yeah. Um, I have to run Yes. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Elizabeth? Hi. Um, I uh, loved in today's lesson from the prophet Isaiah, we have the phrase, the restorer of streets to live in. Right. We all heard that. So um, that, um, speaking to this slide, it gives me a, a, a basis that we're working from something that is part of our tradition. And jumping to the now, I remember last spring when we had a capstone event for the Some of Us book uh, group, and one of the speakers was a member of the uh, MCCSC school board, and right now I can't remember her name. April Hennessy. Yeah, and what she talked about was how the um, issues related to current Bloomington schools are very much related to the historical nature of where people live. And that's something that we can certainly keep in, in mind because this boils down to a matter of money and how schools are treated. In the back. My name is Wade Reed. We're brand new here. One thing. You said these deeds cannot be changed. You yeah. said these, these restrictions cannot be eliminated. My question is, why? Why not? Yeah. And I'm sure there's some legal reason that, that explains that. But I, I can't imagine that there aren't ways of overcoming any legal restrictions. Okay, yeah, just a point of clarification. The restriction cannot be removed from those historical documents. The racially restrictive covenants are illegal and unenforceable, but they are part of this historical document. Um, you know, I've talked to the county recorder about this, and um, in some states they can be removed. Other states they can't. Uh, it's down to state law, I guess. In Indiana they can't be removed. However, you know, as of two years ago, uh, as a property owner, you, you can add your own, you know, statement just kind of clarifying that they're... Uh, abhorrent and unenforceable. Hi, a few years ago um, we were asked by one of the African American churches in town to provide some grant funds to assist with a major renovation and it did not uh, it did not fit the terms of our grant program so they weren't given the money but I've always really regretted that, and I think that it's something we could consider revisiting, if appropriate, because if because we were able to have so many wealthy people be members of our parish, over time that's where our endowment comes from, that's how we're able to keep our building in quite nice condition, and so that's just something I want to offer for people to be aware of. Okay, thank you. And by the way, uh, Anna Green is trying to collect all of your questions and comments, and I would really like to follow up on that with you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't recall the details, but the city of Evanston, in fact, passed uh, uh, Evanston, oh, no, I'm sorry, passed grant reparations, and if families, there's clear evidence that families were longtime residents of Evanston, they're eligible for reparations. I don't know, I do not know the size of the reparations. Yeah, that's correct. Evanston, Illinois is one of a few cities in the United States that have uh, passed local laws to start paying reparations to black families if they can show that they were directly affected by racial housing discrimination in the past. In Evanston, it's being funded by marijuana tax. <laughs> I 
think we can probably go for another five minutes. Yeah. I'll... Judy, you haven't spoken yet. What do you have to say? Uh, as a grandmother, I am well aware of the difference between Summit and other elementary schools in the city. Until people of minority have the money to buy into neighborhoods that feed into better schools, we will have a problem. There is terrible turnover at Summit, Temple, uh, Tem uh, not Temple, but Fairview. They cannot afford to stay where they're at. Mm -hmm. I can walk into a neighborhood, folks, and you know you can. You can tell those houses that are subsidized. <clears throat> and they're filled with people with subsidized. They don't have any encouragement. Uh, my daughter goes, a granddaughter goes to Summit because John's addition was moved into Summit to up the test performance. Okay? I'll let you fill in the details. Why? So I think we need to, as a church, and it's going to be bad, uh, literally banging away at, at, at a system in Indiana that is well, I came from the West Coast. We had our own problems, but this wasn't one of them. But anyway, we need to start fighting our legislature and starting in our city to stop the, the absolute building of these homes for the rich that come in here, stay a year, leave, spend their money, ruin the property, and don't care what goes on. There's no place for people to live that don't have a lot of money. Okay, and so that's one of the things. The last thing I want to say is there's a housing development going on Roger Street. They bought a farm. I cannot in my mind imagine the density of that population. I do know what school it's going to. Summit. Summit was full the day it was built. And they would not listen to the teachers that we had to build it bigger. So this is, they say it's upscale, but I, and, and there's no place for children to play. Mm -hmm. I've looked, I mean, unless they've got it somewhere. And this is along a busy street. So we need to fight it, for, fight it as much as we can to stop the, the builders coming through and saying, we'll do this, we'll do that. No, they don't. So that's what I'm saying. So I think we need to search our hearts and make this a priority that there's a fund, there's affordable housing and the, it's no the redlining is occurring because public housing and lower expensive or less expensive homes are in areas that fit, feed into one or two schools in the city so that's that's all i have to say okay i think we have have time for one more is there anyone who hasn't uh, spoken yet would like to. Yeah, please. This is more of a um, kind of operational type of question, maybe pro forma. But is there a way that, I live in a house that's over 100 years old, um, is there a way that those of us who live in this community, A, can find out if our property is on a deed with a restrictive covenant, and B, is there a way that we can yes. develop a boilerplate response that we can add to that deed, per the new law, that yes. says, yeah, that's horrible. We're not there. We're moving forward. Or some way that we as a church even can contribute to building a movement within our community that says, hey, let's all do this. Let's all as a community come together and say, here's this history. We acknowledge it. We know better. We're going to do better. We're going to start with our own deeds and our own property. And then we can also develop, obviously, wider reaching responses but starting with just ourselves and saying, we're going to start with ourselves and say, we can do this. We can start here. Okay, um, 10 minutes until the next prayer service starts, so let's wrap it up. Um, just to, I want to quickly respond to that. Um, yes, you, you can look up your street address on this map that we've created. Um, the link is on the bottom. Uh, you know, approach me, I'll get it to you. Um, I'm in the church directory from a couple of years ago, or by right around. Um, and yeah, so, so you, you, you can you can look up your street address in the little search 
uh, bar on the interactive map. And um, there is boilerplate language for House Bill 1314. Um, I, think you, I think what you do is you go to the county recorder's office and you, you ask them, how can you get this attached to your property deed? Um, if you want to absolutely make sure you're doing it correctly, you might want to do it with a real estate lawyer. Um, that sounds expensive to me. I would probably just go talk to the, the county recorder directly. Um, and first of all, I just want to say thank you to everyone. Um, I think it takes courage to even talk about these things as a group, and I really appreciated this discussion that we have. Um, so Trinity's uh, Commission for Compassion, Peace, and Reconciliation has a racial justice subcommittee. Um, I'm part of that, and we're, we, we have just published this um, work, and I think we're now we're looking uh, to what we want to do next. So if you would like to be part of that uh, conversation with us, I invite you to join the commission and be a part of that conversation with us. And uh, Rev. Matt, would you like to say something to me? Yeah. Uh, well, I definitely want to thank Nate for leading this uh, from our part, and also all the other folks who contributed Elizabeth Millie. Uh, to this kind of work. The work is really boring and slow um, and detail-oriented. Um, and um, also, you know, if you want, um, one other possibility is we have yet to go through all of our membership records, which we have all the way back to 1925, uh, which is how I found Agnes. Um, and we could also do some of that correlation as well to expand our understanding. Um, but I did want to thank and commend Nate and all of you. Um, you know, when I was looking as to where I might be called, God might be calling me next, one of the things that attracted me to Trinity was that there was this focus on justice and on racial justice, and it was already going on. I, I didn't have to come in and, and preach for five years to say, you know, there's something we ought to do. Um, and, and it's just, I'm so impressed with this community and all of you that you're willing to look at this because it's, it's hard. It's hard. We feel ashamed. We feel angry. When I heard, I hadn't heard the pure, I can barely even say it, um, kind of like, it makes me angry, it makes me sad, uh, makes me ashamed deeply. Um, and, you know, I think I'm, I'm very proud of everybody for working with that and through it. We're going to continue to work through it. Like David said, we do need to just talk about it um, and process it because if we kind of cram that down, uh, it's hard to move on to the next phase of justice and hope. And so I commend that to you and, and then invite, I, I thought, you know, we should end this with prayer. Um, and so if you could please stand if you're able. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, God of justice, whose Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, reached out to all those around him, regardless of what society thought of them. We come before you with feelings of shame and anger and sadness over the racial injustices in this community in this nation uh, that even people in our church have participated in willingly or knowingly or unknowingly. And we just ask you to continue to hear our cries, to comfort us with the knowledge of your forgiveness and grace, and from out of that forgiveness and grace, give us the strength to make the changes we need to right these wrongs and restore creation to the harmony you intend for it. All this we pray through the holy and undivided Trinity. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you.